We just haven't is seen there, it. Is there any risk that I could um, eat a plant-based diet and have so many potatoes and squash and brown rice and wild rice that I could get myself into trouble with my blood sugar? Yes, if your consumption of uh, fat-rich foods is also high simultaneously. Okay, what you don't want to do is hang out in no man's land where you're eating a significant amount of potatoes and fruits and legumes and whole grains, which are carbohydrate rich. And simultaneously, you're also eating a lot of nuts and seeds and avocados and oils. Because if you do that, then effectively you're in no man's land where your carbohydrate intake is high and your fat intake is, is also you know medium to high. And as a result of that, that's going to cause your blood glucose to do some very strange things and it's going to increase your chronic disease risk. So what we recommend is actually, if you're going to increase your carbohydrate intake from, again, fruits, legumes, whole grains, and starchy vegetables, then you simultaneously also decrease your total fat content. And the reason for that is very simple because I've studied biochemistry for almost for over 20 years. And while I was studying biochemistry in graduate school from 2007 to 2012 in, uh, at UC Berkeley, I was studying underneath Dr. Mark Hellerstein, who's one of the, the uh, world's most authoritative uh, experts on carbohydrate metabolism. And he drilled into my head thousands of times over that eating a, carb, a high carbohydrate diet is only possible when your fat intake is also low. And the reason that that, that occurs is because the enzymatic machinery inside of your, your liver and inside of your muscle is, is the enzymatic machinery inside of your liver and muscle is gonna adapt to your fuel source. So if you are consuming a high fat diet, then you effectively activate, uh, you activate a whole collection of enzymes that are responsible for fatty acid absorption, fatty acid storage, and fatty acid oxidation. Okay, so this is the, sort of the, the symphony of enzymes that are responsible for fatty acid uh, uptake storage and oxidation. So if you're going to upregulate those enzymes by eating a fat rich diet, then what you're simultaneously going to do is you're going to suppress all of the carbohydrate, uh, enzymatic machinery that's responsible for carbohydrate uptake, carbohydrate storage and carbohydrate oxidation. Okay. So the two of these enzymatic machines work in opposite direction. So if you increase fatty acid machinery, then you simultaneously suppress carbohydrate uh, enzymatic machinery. And that's true inside of your liver. It's true inside of your muscle. And so th th there's specific reasons why this happens from a biological perspective, but if one of them is high and that, that suppresses natively the opposite machinery, then what that means is that if you eat a high fat diet, that's low in carbohydrate, then you, you, you can actually metabolize that, uh, that collection of nutrients simultaneously, if you do the exact opposite and you increase your carbohydrate intake that suppresses natively or endogenously your enzymatic machinery for fatty acid, uh, for the, for all fatty acid related activities. And so the only way that you can do it is either by eating a diet that's high in fat or by eating a diet that's high in carbohydrate. And that, that has to be true while the other one stays low. But if you try and do both of them simultaneously and increase your fatty acid intake while increasing your carbohydrate intake simultaneously, then you're running into a scenario where you are asking tissues to have both enzymatic machines on simultaneously. And that's where people run into significant problems because both machines cannot operate simultaneously um, in both tissues, in your liver and in your uh, muscle simultaneously. So it becomes a real problem from a biological perspective. And that's why you'll find that people in the ketogenic world demonstrate that they have excellent blood work again, because they've upregulated fatty acid machines and they've lowered their carbohydrate machines. But if you look at people in the plant-based world, you'll see that they're also getting phenomenal blood work because they've upregulated their carbohydrate machinery and they have downregulated their fatty acid machinery. So both of them get good results, but in the long term, the studies demonstrate that the people who are eating the plant-based foods actually end up with the best results. And the people who are eating the ketogenic diet actually end up with worse results over the course of time. So when you eat beans and whole grains. Do you Correct. personally ever add avocado or oil to it? Do I ever? No. So I have zero oil in my diet and I haven't had oil for 20 years. And that's a personal choice. Um, a little bit of oil can go a long way. Um, what, Cause I eat a truly low fat diet that contains between 20 and 30 grams of fat per day. And what I found experimentally is that if I add a little bit of oil to my diet, or if I go to a restaurant and there's a little bit of oil, then um, 
what will happen is that during the meal, my blood glucose control will be fine. For the next two hours, there will be no significant deviation in my blood glucose control. But starting at about the two hour marker, sometimes a three hour marker, my blood glucose goes extremely high. And that's a result of a, it's basically an extended or it's a, it's a late onset post prandial hyperglycemia, which means it takes a couple of hours to start and then it causes hyperglycemia or high blood glucose in the post prandial state in the post meal state. That happens when I consume oil. And when I choose to have a little bit of avocado, the effect is still there, but it is suppressed just a little bit. So having a little bit of avocado here and there is not a, that much of a big deal, but nuts and seeds tend to trigger that effect and oil definitely does as well. And what about coconut products like coconut milk and coconut yogurt? Is that a high fat product? Yeah, those tend to be high fat products as well. And they don't necessarily have as, uh, as potent of an effect as oil does personally. Um, that's what I've observed, but having a little bit of those foods can definitely cause some higher blood glucose values that are just, you know, make my life a little bit more complicated. And what about there are cans of hearts of palm that are very like tasty vegetables. Are those okay? Or is there something I'm not understanding about that? Yeah. You know what? Um, my, my daughter is a hearts of palm fan and my wife loves it as well. And I have small amounts of it as well. I actually don't know what the nutritional, what the, what the macronutrient ratio is in the heart of Palm myself. So I'm going to plead ignorance on that for the time being. Okay. But what I have noticed is that when I consume them, it doesn't really cause any blood glucose uh, variation. And I think in the past, when I have taken a look at the new, the nutrient breakdown, I do remember it being a relatively low fat food, but I, I don't want to you know misquote anything. So I'll have to go back and take a look at that again. Okay. Where are you on nutritional supplements on you know, all the different vitamins, minerals, chlorellas, green powders, probiotics, vitamin B12, C, D. What is your thoughts on nutritional supplementation? Yeah. Okay. That's a great question. So, um, you know, people who choose to eat a fully plant-based diet definitely take some B12, no question about it. Right. Um, so I'm not going to refute that in any way, shape or form. Um, but when it comes to, you know, supplementation with, um, just like you recommended for various vitamins, various minerals, and then algae supplements in particular, um, the, the simple recommendation that we give, like everybody has a very specific different disease background and a different health background that leads them to today. And so I can't make some blanket statement that says, oh, never take any vitamins or never take any minerals or definitely don't take any, uh, omega-3 supplements. Cause that would not be smart. Um, the reality is that each individual is going to have to uh, ascertain that themselves. And so what we recommend is work with your doctor. Hopefully your doctor is, an, is, is well-versed on understanding how they can actually measure, um, uh, you know, various metabolites inside of your blood and then give you very good evidence-based recommendations based off of those. What we have found is that um, taking an omega-3 supplement can go a very long way, Okay but we don't recommend that everybody just go to the store and pick up an omega-3 supplement and then start taking it. So the reason I put a focus on omega-3 is because um, uh, the, the research that I've read in the world of omega-3 supplementation is actually, uh, it has sort of changed my mind on it to uh, suggest that taking an omega-3 supplement can be actually be a very powerful tool to have in your, in your back pocket. And uh, the reason for that is because um, there's plenty of research that demonstrates that uh, the omega-6 pathway and the omega-3 pathway in tissues can, you know, they're sort of like constantly dueling with one another. Omega-6 tends to be more pro-inflammatory. Omega-3 tends to be more anti-inflammatory. And as a result of that, um, eating refined processed foods, especially seed oils can increase your omega-6 content significantly. And then that can increase your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. And that is associated with many chronic diseases and a lot of uh, uh, neurocognitive decline. And so nobody wants that to happen. So, so what we suggest is that number one, first and foremost, don't make any assumptions about your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio or your omega-3 status. What you're ideally looking for in an ideal world is that your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, which you can get on a test, on a blood test, is that you want that to be somewhere close to about three to one, four to one, five to one, maybe six to one at the most. So again, that's your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. And if you can keep that in single digits, three to one, four to one, five to one, six to one, then you're actually in a very anti-inflammatory state. Simultaneously with that, we also want your omega-3 status to be 4% or greater. And if you can get your omega-3 status to be 4% or greater and have your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio to be single digits between three and six to one, then you're setting yourself up for long-term success. 
you're setting yourself up for a low risk for, uh, those are indicators that your total inflammatory status is actually quite low. And it actually sets you up for a long-term uh, uh, neuro protection to make sure that you don't enter into cognitive decline into the future. Um, and so what we recommend is rather than making any assumptions about what those, those are, go to your doctor and say, hey, doctor, could you get me an omega-3 or an omega status test? And there's many companies now that have you know, very uh, comprehensive testing. And if you can get that done, then you can have a baseline measurement and try and figure out, do I need more omega-3s or do I need less omega-6s? And based off of that, you can then decide, work with your doctor to try and figure out, am I going to just add flax seeds and chia seeds to my diet? Like freshly ground flax seeds and chia seeds, which is a great way to get some omega-3s. Or do I have to be a little bit more aggressive and take an algae-based supplement? Or do I have to be more aggressive and do that and also limit my intake of omega-6 rich foods as well? So you can kind of go down a path and try and figure out what's the right way to do it. But what we have found is that it, it tends to be a very individual uh, recommendation and that I highly recommend it's worth investigating, but I can't make any blanket statements because that would be unethical. So if we take an algae-based oil for omega-3, does, sure. that, does that concern you that even though it's solving one issue, then now it's adding oil to our diet? No, that's a great question actually, because the amount of oil that you consume in an algae-based supplement is so small that it's... The, the, it's not going to negative, it's not going to significantly increase your total uh, fatty acid intake so much that you're going to now, you know, not be able to consume a low fat diet. So in other words, the amount of oil that you consume in an algae based supplement is so small. Don't even worry about it. Have a little bit, if that's going to boost your omega-3 status and keep your omega-6 to omega-3 uh, ratio low, then by all means, by uh, go for it. It shouldn't present a problem.